So welcome to the cybersecurity panel today. Um, I have to admit this is a first time for me, a virtual panel, so I hope this will go well. Um, really quick about myself, I am responsible for the uh, product cybersecurity and also functional safety at LEAR Corporation. Uh, LEAR is the is America's largest uh, automotive supplier located in Southfield. We also have an office in Ann Arbor downtown. Um, I used to be with the University of Michigan with Amtri, still quite involved in M-City, so I'm really glad to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. And um, in today's panel we will talk about cybersecurity of connected and automated vehicles. Uh, wanna touch on, you know, obviously technologies, uh, mitigation, um, but also on collaboration. How are we successful together? And how do we, you know, test cybersecurity and, and, you know, make sure that our products are secure? Um, I'm really happy about having the panel that we have today. I think we have a great mixture. We have, and you can see them on the screen, screen. We have uh, Sam Lawson from Amtri. He was to me, my colleague at Amtri. We have, um, I hope I can say your name, Raphael Moton from Adia Security. We have uh, Cindy Mills from the Washington Community College and Christy Fosi of Mitsubishi Electric Automotive. Um, with that, I would like um, each panelist, starting with Sam, to you know introduce yourself, say who you are, who do you work for, and basically what is your job. Uh, all right, hi. Can you hear me, Andre? Yes. Yes. Uh, so my name is Sam Lozon. I'm a lead engineer in research with Umtri, University of Michigan's Transportation Research Institute, and I focus mainly on cybersecurity and privacy issues um, and all sorts of transportation. Um, we've been working with uh, NHTSA, DOT, and VOLP, uh, those sorts of groups. Um, mainly working with uh, sensors recently, uh, worked with um, over-the-air updates um, and intrusion detection technologies. Thank you, Sam. Then, Rafael? Uh, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Rafael Muton, I'm uh, with uh, Dea Security. Uh, CEO and founder. Uh, we are headquartered in downtown Detroit and we focus on um, small, medium sized businesses as well as in the future a uh, consumer um, with a SaaS uh, platform uh, to protect their endpoints and uh, different areas in their home or businesses. Thank you. And then, Cindy. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Thanks. Um, I'm Cindy Milnes. Um, I am the lead faculty for cybersecurity at Washtenaw Community College. I've been there for almost two years now. Prior to that, I taught computer networking and cybersecurity at Pinckney High School in Livingston County and led the launch of the Pinckney Cyber Training Institute, which is the first and um, I believe still the only high school that is a Michigan Cyber Range hub using the Michigan Cyber Range for testing. Uh, prior to teaching cybersecurity, I worked in risk management, human resource management, and compliance. All right, thank you, Cindy. And last but not least, Christy. Hi, thanks, Andre. Hi, Christy Fosey from Mitsubishi Electric. Uh, Mitsubishi Electric is a tier one automotive supplier. We primarily make infotainment systems, powertrain modules, ADOS products, uh, basically the uh, biggest threat vectors into the vehicle affecting safety and security. I have responsibility for global product cybersecurity, so anything on vehicle security related for any of our products. Um, that's it. All right, thank you, Christy. So, perfect. Uh, well, we, we prepared a few questions that we thought are interesting for you. Um, quite frankly, I by far prefer if there's some interaction with the audience. And I know that's, uh, that, you know, that might be tough. I think you need to type it in. 
but please, um, if you have any questions from the audience, uh, please type them in. And um, you know, I think that will also enable us to uh, be of more value to, to what you do, what you work on, or what questions you might have. Um, and I assume I can see the questions in the chat box once you type them in. So at any time, just shoot, type them in. Don't wait for the end. Hey, Andre, this is Francine, just to interject a little bit. Um, if those panelists who have video capability, if you'd like to make your video available, um, then we may have a little bit more of an interactive experience. People really enjoy seeing the faces of the people who are, who are speaking. Um, and again, as Andre just mentioned, please go ahead on the Q&A button um, and add your question. Andre will be able to see them. And Andre, if we get too many, I will be here to um, moderate them and share them with, with you to um, have your panelists address. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Well, I just turned on my video. I can't see myself, interestingly. Um, I hope you can see me and I'm really glad that it turned out to be of value that I put on a shirt for the first time in like a month. So, um, with that, let's start with the first question for the panelists uh, before you, the audience, can think of your own questions. So, what do you think are currently the main issues of connected and automated vehicle cybersecurity? And what are you working on? You know, often people start this with like, what gives you a hard time to sleep? Um, during the night. What, what do you think, what we should do and what are you working on? So let's start again with Sam. Uh, all right, I got my video here. Hello everyone. <laughs> so recently we've been working with um, NHTSA investigating sensors and the ability for a malicious actor to sort of um, manipulate the environment to fool a sensor, um, say for example, video. Uh, could I put a speed limit sign on the back of a shirt and actually have the vehicle pick that up, believe it as a real speed sign, and then take action on it, either alert the driver or um, in the case of an autonomous vehicle, speed up, slow down. And other researchers have sort of jumped on the same bandwagon and have shown that a Tesla uh, does believe signs that aren't actually real. Um, so I think that uh, the sensors and the data being fed into these systems is very critical at this point, um, especially in a Vita X environment where that data might be relayed to other vehicles or other people in the environment as well. Yeah, great topic. And M City is actually working a lot on that. Um, Rafael, what do you think? What are you working on? Yeah, so um, I think there you know, as an outsider looking into the auto industry, um, I'm not seeing a standard approach to how to tackle this, especially with the vehicles. Um, you know, there's a misconception out there that cybersecurity is an IT item. Um, and I think that that's changing in a lot of industries and would need to do so with the car manufacturers um, and kind of at the forefront, um, similar to, uh, important it is to have seat belts and brakes and everything else that you see in a vehicle. Um, I also think the technology that are going into vehicles are amazing. Um, but with that, we need to start looking through the lens of, you know, with that technology, it's the same as it's coming into your home for a consumer. And with that, there's a lot of things that can happen from a vehicle perspective. Um, if we don't start having some standards, um, over the last, what I've been doing over the last year, I've founded a day of security. As I mentioned earlier, we're headquartered in uh, downtown Detroit. Um, we focus on, you know, ensuring that small and medium-sized companies, as well as consumers, have some form of a complete solution versus point products that are usually designed for the enterprise. Um, nothing wrong with that, but you know, if you look at what's out there, a lot of the things need to be maintained by. IT professionals or infosec professionals. And what we're trying to do is change that mindset, um, which aligns to what's going on with the auto industry and in that you really need to peel things back and look holistically at all user groups, um, especially we feel small business um, and uh, medium-sized customers. So we're prioritizing the software, we're 
in a way that they can leverage it as well as pricing it um, in a way that they can afford it. Yes, yeah, thanks, great comment. Um, Cindy. Yes, so one of the main issues that I kind of, that makes me stay up at night is um, talent and ensuring that we have a future workforce who understands both automotive and cybersecurity um, and can train in an environment that's similar, if not close to identical as to what they might see in industry. Um, recently, back last year, uh, Washtenaw Community College purchased an automotive hacking workbench that was developed by one of our industry partners, Grimm, and they specialize in testing cyber physical systems, including automotive. Um, we've used this to train individuals on how to identify, interpret, and manipulate CAN bus signals um, to demonstrate unintended consequences and how to identify security measures that need to be put into place. Along with that, I've been working to launch an automotive cybersecurity certificate for the college that includes courses in local and mobile networking essentials, network security, automotive electrical systems, computer science, and then a capstone class pen testing automotive platforms. And one of the, for me, the most exciting things about this is crossing over and collaborating with our automotive technology department and faculty there. So we're really coming together um, you know, as a cohesive unit in developing this program. Um, so we're looking to, to develop this program to meet the in, uh, demand for highly skilled automotive cybersecurity professionals. Um, it introduced them to the skills and strategies that are needed to be able to test security related to any automobile network and related infrastructure. So we're really excited about that and um, the partnerships we're developing and, you know, the, the abilities that we're going to have to kind of contribute to that, that talent um, needed in the industry. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's an excellent topic and I'm sure you're Pretty much everyone here on the call who's desperate hiring people with <laughs> that skill. So thank you. Um, Christy. Yeah, I think, you know, this is not something that's unique only to automotive, right? As the entire world is experiencing this digital transformation of these traditionally mechanical systems like your car are now being primarily software driven and now connected on top of that, that that adds in a lot of inherent risk, not only to legacy products that were never designed to be connected to the internet because the internet didn't exist when they were designed, but then even looking forward, right? You have an engineer who has, you know, written, you know, steering control module software or um, hard, made hardware decisions for the last 20 years and has never had to consider cybersecurity before. And so it's this, this step change that we're trying to get caught up on. And so we, as an industry, we made a decision to make everything connected. And now we're kind of playing catch up and realizing, oh, we should have thought about security at the same time. So I think we've taken our lessons learned there for sure. But really, it's a cultural change that the entire industry has to go through and to experience, right? So we need to make sure that every engineer is educated on cybersecurity and that they're aware of it and the impact that their decisions and their design choices make for the end product. And so where, you know, the industry has been through this before, where safety is everyone's responsibility, now cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility as well. Yeah, perfect topic. Sounds you made similar experiences as I did. Um, all right, so once again, I think that should have given you like a, a dozen questions at least or so. And actually I see one. So let me just read this here. Um, yes. So the question is, um, and any one of you can answer. Uh, so is this, so is cybersecurity just an issue for the future or are advanced autos? Um, Tesla has given here as an example, but there are many more, already being hacked. Who wants to give it a try and answer? Well, that does kind of lend into um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about and whether that's realistic, that can somebody actually hack into a vehicle and is it happening? And you just have to search car hack on the internet. Not that the internet is, you know, 100% factual, but you're gonna find a multitude of articles and news headlines. For example, one of them that popped right up was exploiting the Wi-Fi stack on a Tesla Model S. 
Um, another big study that I've followed, um, Keen Security Labs, um, working with the BMW, they've gained local and remote access to infotainment components, telematics, and diagnostic systems. Um, and they can actually gain control of the CAM bus with the execution of arbitrary code. So there are things happening currently. Um, you know, another one this morning, I did a quick search on the CVE database um, showing any of the um, uh, vulnerabilities that have been identified out there in the wild. And there's one in 2020 um, that is um, on a popular 2017 model year display control unit that um, allows an un unauthenticated attacker with Bluetooth range to cause a denial of service attack. They're out there. Um, so it's, it's definitely something we need to, um, you know, to, to be, be paying attention to what's happening. Definitely. Yeah, I think there's, you know, like Cindy's saying, like there's technologies that we're putting on our vehicles today that are out on other products as well, like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi that have vulnerabilities discovered on them. And then they can be therefore, you know, exploited on a vehicle. And absolutely that's happening today. I think the risk profile increases significantly for future vehicles, right? More autonomy where your vehicle is now making a decision, like Sam was talking about in his intro, based on some sort of input that has now been fabricated or been manipulated through a cyber attack. And now your vehicle's making a safety decision based on poor or, you know, uh, data that doesn't have any integrity to it, for example. Um, so I think that definitely the, the threat profile increases, right, with Tesla's and more autonomy. And as we go down to level four and level five, certainly becomes a higher risk. We also see higher risk as we go through additional features that we add to our vehicles, right? One of the things that we try to do as engineers, especially working in infotainment, is to try to make that driver experience better, right? And, and some ways to do that is, you know, now we're going to put credit card transactions on your vehicle, right? So now you don't even have to interface with the person at the drive through Your vehicle pays for you, or you don't have to, you know, interface with the gas pump. Your vehicle, you know, makes the that financial transaction happen on your behalf. Well, now your vehicle has a bigger threat profile because now we have financial data stored on your vehicle that didn't exist there before. So I think that, you know, as we continue to add these more additional features and as we um, try to increase that, that driver experience and more autonomy into the vehicle, certainly the risks are only gonna continue to get bigger. Sure. Anyone else? And I can add to that in that um, sort of some of these firmware issues that we were talking about with the Bluetooth of the Wi-Fi stack, some of those are hard coded onto uh, chips and some infotainment systems aren't able to update those features or those particular areas of the infotainment system, you know, as where a regular software update covers, you know, the user facing portion, it doesn't actually cover the firmware for the Wi-Fi chips and things like that. So. Um, looking at the longevity of a vehicle on the road, whether it's 10, 20 years, we have to look at how long you know, services are going to be able to be supported, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, because exploits are going to be found in technologies made today. Um, so as we continue on, we'll still have to prepare for everything that's made and, and how long we want to support it. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to add, I, I don't, you know, all the cyber security is new, Today, estimates are that about 50% of cars are stolen by undermining the electronics. And, you know, that's like, that started something like 20 years ago. So it's a pretty old issue. All right. I want to move on to privacy. Um, Raphael, should we care about privacy? Um, what is the worst thing that can actually happen regarding privacy? Yeah, I think um, Christy touched on it. So we absolutely need to worry about privacy the same way we do with our phones now in vehicles. The automakers are going to put what I would call the ease of use items into our vehicles like credit cards or connecting with our home. All great technology, but it does open up the door for a hacker to gain that information. And I'll say at the information level because I don't like using fear in cybersecurity, but that information is used to get into other areas of your life. It could be your bank account. It could be into your business. So even though you might be thinking right now, but it's just a car and yeah, they're putting my information into it. 
I would say that you, we need to start thinking of them like we do now with our phones. We're so hypersensitive about the information on our phones. It's that information that's so valuable. Um, with all the cool technology that's going in, Wi-Fi, um, as you, you know, some of the things you've mentioned from the question to is it really an issue now or in the future, it, it is. Uh, right now, I think it really is about the privacy of your data and what's going on in the vehicle. I also think that right now you see a lot of ethical hackers, which is some of those videos that are out there, trying to show the audio and auto industry from their perspective what can be done in the current vehicles. I think that in the future, your privacy could even get down to the conversations you're having, who you are, um, and what they're trying to achieve either through government agencies or um, other sensitive information. So long way of answering your question, privacy is really important. We're seeing that that is the next phase of where, um, unfortunately, the bad hackers want to go. And it purely is around gathering information about you or your data so that they can leverage it in other areas um, as they progress um, in different industries or um, the information can be sold on the black market. Um, if you talk about the one that I followed was was the uh, ethical hack of the Jeep, that was almost five years ago. And that was still not the level of technology that are in vehicles today. Um, as we get into self-driving vehicles and um, a lot of cloud-based offering in those vehicles, I just go back to, in the simplest form, think of your uh, your phone or even your laptop that we all know now we need to critically protect, that's that's how we need to start thinking about our vehicles. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and I'd like to add just uh, maybe another corner case to consider for privacy is right now, you know, your vehicle has GPS on it, and so that data could potentially be harnessed, which for the average consumer is probably not the biggest concern, right? The fact that I drive to work and you know, go to the grocery store, that's not super exciting. Well, you know, once upon a time before I was stuck in my house. Um, but if you look at other vehicles that are sold for fleet purposes, like to law enforcement or to intelligence organizations, right? So now you have a, you know, FBI Detroit vehicle that's going to go visit specific assets and specific safe locations, right, of what they expect. And then they need to go and sell that vehicle is all that data stored on that vehicle? Is it being pushed off of that vehicle? What are the concerns that they have from an operational point of view to protect their assets and their sources and means? And now the vehicle is an end road to get to that data. So just a kind of another uh, use case for the privacy that maybe we don't really think about necessarily as, a, as an average consumer, but certainly something that will continue to grow and be an issue, right? Just like we have with our cell phones, as you identified, not everybody wants their cell phone broadcasting their location all the time. Well, now our vehicles are doing the same thing. Right. Yeah, that's actually another concern for um, unmarked government vehicles in the event that they remove communications from them. Are they then anomalous and can an attacker be able to identify an unmarked government vehicle in a way. Um, so there, there's a double-edged sword there as well. Yeah, so, very true. So Christy, why don't you continue? Um, should we actually only be concerned about the vehicle or also about the larger ecosystem? You know, there's manufacturing, cloud servers, cars might be, op uh, might be able to open your garage door, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think that's actually you know, in terms of current security issues is some of our biggest problems, right? So the hacking of the vehicle is not as um, well established in the hacker community, right? To get practice on your car and you accidentally break your $50,000 vehicle, like that's a, that's a pretty big oopsie compared to looking at technologies that exist in other markets that have other maybe greater monetary gain in other industries to understand that technology, right? And so looking at cloud services, that certainly has huge implications across many different industries. And so as a hacker, if I'm gonna choose a technology to be an expert in, that seems like a really viable one. And so as the, car, as the cards, uh, as our vehicles become more and more connected to the cloud, that certainly becomes one of the biggest risk factors. So again, lots of data, lots of privacy on the cloud, 
um, for data coming off the vehicle. That's also how we potentially push out updates to the vehicle. So again, you know, sending out malicious code direct to the vehicle through an established and, um, you know, potentially believable, concerned, uh, secure interface to the vehicle. So I think, you know, looking at that larger ecosystem is definitely something that needs to be considered and it needs to be protected, not just onboard the vehicle, but also anything that interfaces with it offboard the vehicle. Same thing as you identified through our manufacturing plants, right? If we start, you know, putting bad hardware or hardware that's been injected with malicious code already that is now being installed on our vehicles and rolling off the assembly line as you know considered to be validated or even signed with our OEM certificates, whatever it might be, that poses a pretty significant risk to our vehicle operation as well. Very good. All right, so I found there's a Q&A, a dedicated Q&A um, box here and we sort of got the question for everything so from a top 10 guiding principles for automated and connected vehicle readiness standpoint what should oems and infrastructure owner operators be focused on during the next two to three years you, you can hopefully see that also on your screen And this uh, um, question comes from the WS, what is that, Washington DOT? Ted Bailey. Might be Wisconsin? Wisconsin. Could be Wisconsin. Um, I think data integrity is a huge thing. Um, like I said, the, the data coming from sensors um, being transmitted to other vehicles with V2X or even to the roadside um, and understanding exactly what happens when a sensor is damaged. For example, if you're in a, a minor vehicle accident, your radar is um, bumped or out of alignment, can the vehicle know that the radar is out of alignment so that it actually prevents that data from being sent to other cars erroneously uh, and that sort of thing. So I think integrity of the data is going to be very critical. It's Washington State. <laughs> Washington, yes, thanks Ted, Washington State. What about uh, software updates over the air? I think software updates over the air is a, a very important thing. Um, however, I think it's also sort of a double-edged sword. If their critical vulnerability is known and an operator pushes out an update too quickly, uh, they may introduce other flaws into the software as well. So they have to be very careful about how often they update the software and that they're doing all the appropriate checks and making sure they're not introducing new bugs or new flaws for attackers to take advantage of along the way. All right. Any other opinions? What about the new ISO standard 21434? Do you think that should be on that list? I can let anyone else jump in as well. <laughs> sure. Um, standards are great as long as people actually adhere to them. And um, I think in Europe where you have type certification and, and other people looking at how you're building a vehicle, uh, it's a little different than how it's done in the States. Um, but I, at the same time, I don't think any vehicle manufacturer or equipment manufacturer wants to be the company that gets their stuff hacked. Uh, so I think everybody's doing as much as they can do, um, you know, and they look at the standards and they, they take those into account pretty thoroughly. Yeah, and I think the one thing you have to keep in mind too with the standards like that is once you create the standard, it's not done. Um, it's baseline, and that's going to be ever evolving, especially you know with the V2X utilization. Um, so I think that's another thing that we have to look at is how are we con continuously adapting that? Um, you know, and yeah, I, I'm a standards person. That's where my background is. I love compliance, but unfortunately, it's only you know part of the equation. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thank you. I see another question here. I combine that one with one of ours. So question is, as cybersecurity uh, is being a research topic in other disciplines, such as computer science, sorry, cybersecurity has been a research topic in other disciplines, such as computer science for years. 
how is the cyber security and transportation different or special from other disciplines? And um, I would, I would uh, modify that slightly, either from other domains, industries like airplanes, medical, IT, um, or you know, the security industry in general. I, I, I'm just sorry, I, I think that the um, I think the baseline of cybersecurity principles is the same, no matter where you're, what industry you're in. I think you then have to take the unique items from that industry and see how to apply it. We go back to what Christy and some others have mentioned. Majority of the items that are going to happen in these vehicles are software driven and code based. Millions and millions of codes. That doesn't mean we need to change what other cloud services or industries have already done with the same type of technology or programming. I think that that's where having a working group or uh, standards, um, as Cindy had mentioned, is critical so that you're not rebuilding the wheel. There are decades of cybersecurity standards. It's just looking through the lens of an automaker and ensuring that you're allowing experts in the industry to partner with the manufacturers and help guide them through this, not give them guidance and then let them go on their own with potential for a risk to the consumer or to agencies like Christy mentioned, if they purchase vehicles uh, that are over designed as well to protect them. Yes, yeah, very good. I'm not too sure if this is applicable, but from a, a physical security approach, you always look at layers. You know, so if you're trying to protect your house, you want to you know put cameras on the outside or build a fence around your property and that sort of thing. And I think automotive security is very similar in that uh, you know once somebody actually gets access to your CAN bus, uh, it's sort of over. So how do you protect your CAN bus? How do you protect that data integrity? Like I said, and then how do you build sort of layers going outward so that your interfaces like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, your V to X are also protected, and that if they are compromised in some way, how is the vehicle going to you know maintain its security or safety level? Yeah, excellent. All right, let's let's move towards uh, V to X vehicle to everything communication so how much should we actually be concerned about v2x security you know uh, an argument that i often hear and and sort of also created a bit was that in the end it's all about driver notifications um, and um, you know also radar and camera based systems produce false errors so it seems to be not much of a big deal right if we have a security issue Sam, do you want to start? Well, <laughs> it's not just from a security perspective, but again, if you get into a, you know, a minor fender bender or something like that, and your radar is unable to determine that it's been misaligned, uh, and then it starts throwing out alerts to you, and you say, oh, yeah, my fender is, is out of alignment. But if it starts passing on those errors further down the road to other vehicles or to roadside units, what is the impact of that? Um, and then how do you remediate that? How do you say, you know, this car is misbehaving? Um, those sorts of uh, implementations are being studied and looked at now and, and worked out the implementation of, and I think that's very important. All right, very good. Um, and then how can we test I put V to X security, but I guess we can make it broader. How can we test security properly? Um, it's easy to test for standard compliance on a functional sense, but it's tough to test security, right? Um, Christy, what do you think? Did we lose Christy? Does anyone else want to answer? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right, sorry, my internet was uh, getting flaky. Um, you know, I think that the biggest challenge that most people have with testing for security is that you're trying to test these, these corner cases, right? It's not the straightforward, um, you know, functional testing. If I push this button, does this happen? It's, 
if I push these series of buttons and I do use it in a way that it's not intended to be used, can I trick it to get into a state where I have greater control than I am intended to have, right? And so I think that's some of the, the challenges around the security compliance issues and when it comes to testing. But I think, you know, as, as Sam and others have talked about, if we can build out our defense in depth strategy and our security strategy, and we can, you know, guarantee that we, uh, or, you know, validate that we have done those implementations correctly, I think that's a good start towards getting some sort of standardized compliance in security. Now, the challenge that I think we'll continue to have is, again, going back to this cultural issue, is that even if we test for security compliance today, that unlike safety or traditional safety compliance or, you know, um, testing, is that cybersecurity is a continuously evolving activity, right? Safety is relatively static. We did a crash test and it passed at 10 Gs or whatever, and now we can say we've checked that box and we've moved on. But cybersecurity is reacting to outside forces that we don't control, right? These malicious actors and what are they doing and what kind of technology uh, evolutions are happening in these other spaces. So we can say that this is secure today and a new vulnerability is disclosed tomorrow, you know, based on open source libraries or whatever, or these standard technologies that we've been talking about that are also included in our vehicles. And now that's no longer valid, right? And so I think that's, that's where the real challenge becomes for security testing um, is that it's not, it's not that we tested it once and we're done, we can put it on the shelf, we never have to look at it, at it ever again. And so it's coming up with what that, that cadence is, what that reaction is, how do we manage incident response, how do we manage our vulnerabilities. You know, as Sam alluded to, you know, we can't just push out an update every single day. Uh, that continuous change in our software introduces additional vulnerabilities and additional challenges. So it's coming up with what does that balance look like going forward. So it's, it's kind of, it's a multifaceted challenge to come up with what does it mean to say that we have done security testing, how often do we need to do that, and how do we respond to it throughout the product life cycle? Yeah, yeah, excellent, tough topic. All right, we have, a, we have, a, we have a, an audience question here, and um, might, let's see, it might have been for the previous panel on uh, legal aspects, so I'm not sure if we can answer. So the question is, can you comment on the impact of strengthening security and access on right to repair? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I'm not entirely sure what the intention of the question is, but uh, it's one of my favorite topics, so I'll try it anyway. Uh, so one of the challenges with the right to repair law, just for context and background, is that it gives any user the ability to have access to repair and run diagnostics and stuff on their vehicle so that it eliminates the need for the, the car owner to go into the dealership. So it doesn't give the OEM dealership monopoly on service, but you can go to any mom and pop shop or you can repair it in your own driveway if you have the capabilities and the tools, which are all required to be available to you under right to repair, which causes some uh, challenges on a security aspects because in some sense it's like giving everyone um, network administrator access to your network. Uh, so it's kind of like the inverse of what you really want to be doing from a security standpoint in terms of locking your system down because you now have to make it open to everybody else. But what we can do is we can say that uh, we can build out some restrictions along those lines, right? So now our firmware is signed. It needs to be signed by an OEM uh, PKI authority. And so it can't just be any software that you write, you can upload onto your vehicle now. It has to be something that's approved and signed by um, an OEM. So I think that that's a, that's a first start towards that. Um, we've also looked at um, so previous to being at Mitsubishi, I was at FCA, and so building out and responding to this challenge, of course, is a big part of what the OEMs are, are responsible for, because they have that uh, service aspect that falls under their purview. And so understanding who has access to your vehicles and making sure that now you're tracking those user logins into each vehicle, assigning it to each VIN. And so you can add some additional data integrity behind it to ensure that it's not you're not just getting like a blast of 
uh, different software updates or that there's a reasonable number of vehicles being worked on by each tool each day and those types of things. So it's got some challenges around it, but there's security um, protocols that you can institute all throughout that whole service uh, life cycle uh, from the tool to the vehicle to in the software in between and how it's signed and how it's managed to help um, reduce the security risk associated with right to repair. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, perfect answer. Hey, Andre, this is Francine, and I have a question, I think, um, probably for Cindy. Um, I know that you are involved, you were, were involved at the high school level and now at Washtenaw Community College. Um, and I'm interested in what, um, sort of from a student perspective, about what they see um, the future workforce and career and job opportunities, um, and whether or not students are moving from a two-year um, perhaps a certificate or even an associates to a four-year program. Okay, so the, a couple of questions I, I hear out of that. Um, you know, as far as the ability for students to um, train in this area, right now there's a few sources. Um, Square One does a great job at the um, high school level and even actually younger level as well. Um, getting students excited, interested, and that's kind of where we tend to um, struggle is getting them to understand some of the opportunities that are available beyond, you know, their own computers. So doing, um, adding different programs such as that, um, running cybersecurity camps, um, getting students working with the GRIM unit that I had talked about where um, they're able to go through and conduct some, some simple hacks, if you will. Um, and really a big part of that is mindset of becoming a critical thinker. Um, how do you reverse engineer to figure out what we need to fix or what we need to secure? So, so kind of starting at the, the high school level, getting them interested and excited and kind of rounding out that that type of user, we are seeing a number of different pathways. And there is still um, you know, a, a great amount of students that are looking for that four-year college bachelor degree program. Um, what they're finding too is um, the ability to, to go through a program such as Washington Community Colleges or some of the other um, schools, cybersecurity programs, and then coupling that with a computer science degree. Those are great options and great opportunities. But by creating this environment in automotive cybersecurity where they can focus on a tool, something right now that interests them, and we're getting them that hands-on experience, um, again, with the technologies. We're even looking to build out a lab um, with um, scalable workbenches from an actual, you know, from actual vehicles that, so that they can have that hands-on experience. And I think part of what we can offer at the community college level is that hands-on um, connection. And then also with that, we have to look at a current workforce that we, we have. I get so many um, interested students that coming to me that have already have bachelor's degrees, already have, so a lot of them even have master's degrees that want to come back and train in these other areas. And so being able to provide them with that cybersecurity background to, to um, work alongside of their automotive engineering background is huge. And so having access to certificate programs like that is essential. Um, again, you're going to have many different pathways. Many people are going to choose, you know, they're going to do what works for them. But giving them those options is kind of what really at WCC we're looking at. How can we provide those options? So. It's exciting, exciting stuff going on. And so those of you who are in industry, um, what are you looking for as a potential, um, as a potential hire? So we, we have students um, in our audience right now, um, undergraduate as well as master's level, um, and perhaps they're wondering what it is that they would need to do um, to, be, to be a hire in this area. Um, Ms. Raphael, I think that um, what, I've seen over the last 18 years is definitely what some of the touch points have been discussed around the technical aspect of cybersecurity. There's definitely a need for more engineers and developers, but 
for those students or even high school students or those listening in, it's not all about the technical design. Um, you know, what we look for, and I've looked for in past lives as well as other cybersecurity experts, is good problem solving and communications. There's a whole nother area of cybersecurity that's not code base on analyst operations, um, understanding the different uh, compliance out there and implying it to uh, an organization or even in the auto industry. So I would say that don't assume there's one flavor of cybersecurity to those students listening. And if you're not that technical person, it's okay. Um, having the baseline that we look for is good communication skills. And if you love a good puzzle, there are so many other opportunities with problem solving and cybersecurity that can get your foot in the door as an analyst or a, um, a, a sec op. Andre, why don't you take a stab? You have a pretty big team over there at Lear. What do you look for when you hire into your team? It's so tough. I wish I could actually ask you the question. So, you know, I was in, I was at, in academia, I was at Amtri, now I'm in industry, so I saw the issue from both sides. Um, when I was in academia, it was so tough to work with industry because of all the NDAs and confidentiality agreements. Um, and now being in industry, I understand why, because I need to get so many approvals for these things, right? It, it needs to go up really high in the chain um, and it needs to be reviewed by whatever lawyers. And um, I, in terms of collaboration, you know, so I wish there were more ways of um, kicking off industry and academic collaboration um, of, of doing research together, developments together, and getting over this hurdle of, you know, competitiveness, confidentiality, the concern of uh, someone finding vulnerabilities in your products. And I have to admit, I would be so happy to learn how to do that. Um, so I, I will, <laughs> in a second, uh, come back with a question to you. Now, in terms of who do we need, um, the, the tough reality is that it is, you know, of course, everyone says, yes, you know, we, we are willing to take young, really smart people who are trained in problem solving and who understand certain areas. They don't need to be security experts. But the reality is we will always prefer someone who already has a background. So um, because it, it takes a lot of time to train people, you know, it's like, we don't talk about like three months and then someone is ready to do the job, right? It's like two years, three years. Um, so what we look for is uh, young people who totally agree with Raphael, who, who are, you know, very trained in problem solving. Communication is so important for security, but who additionally have an understanding and mindset of security, whether they displayed it in, um, their, their studies at the university or if they just you know reverse engineered automotive systems to do whatever i i personally prefer um automotive electronics people to security people because they the security part is easier to learn than the automotive electronics all right now let me reverse the question how do we get over these obstacles of you know, academia and industry working together. I'm sure all of you experienced that, right? If you're an industry, you go to the industry, uh, sorry, if you're an academia, you go to industry and it's so tough, right? And if you're an industry, you try to work with academia and it's really tough. I think um, from a historical perspective, security through obscurity was used to be the way. And I think a lot of people are still sort of hanging on to that idea where uh, their intellectual property is going to make their product and their company a whole lot better. And they don't want to share that intellectual property and they want to obscure their intellectual property for safety, security reasons as well, uh, legal 
logistics reasons. Um, you know, somebody finds out the inner workings of a product, will they be sued even if it isn't defective for some reason or it doesn't cause an accident? So I, I think that um, the, the legal environment, the political environment really drives a lot of the openness and the ability for companies to share, which is unfortunate. And I don't know if that's a cybersecurity issue that we can solve here. Yeah, it's a tough one. I know. So if anyone ever has an idea, let me know. Um, you know, one approach is M City, where I'm quite active. Um, some of you are, where at least you know we take some steps to collaborate between academia and, and industry. All right, I we don't have too much time left, but I do want to talk a bit about automated vehicles. So maybe we we have a broad question to all of you. What do you think? What are the um, the important aspects in terms of security in automated cars. Maybe you think, well, it's exactly the same, but maybe it's not, right? And automated really um, in the direction of self-driving vehicles. Who wants to start? All right, fine. <laughs> uh, well, so I'll, I'll take some low-hanging fruit since I have to go first. Um, so I think, as I kind of said earlier, I think that once we add more automation into the vehicles and we go more autonomous and we have greater impact on the decisions that are we're relying more on the decisions that our vehicles are making for the safety of our occupants, then obviously cybersecurity needs to be an enabler for those technologies being added on to the vehicle. And so I think a lot of the work that we're doing today is building the foundation of our security on our vehicles, right? So, you know, like I was talking about this transformation we've gone through based on the life cycle of the development life cycle of vehicles at the OEM level, we're just now getting into building vehicles that have an architecture that was electrical architecture that was built for security, right? So we're, we're trying to separate these infotainment system type extra connectivity for these added uh, driver feature benefits and separate them from the safety functions of the vehicle. And so now we're building out this foundation of this architecture that can now be leveraged into adding increased automation, right? So we're not giving direct Wi-Fi access, unfettered Wi-Fi access direct into our, you know, uh, brake module to make decisions for our vehicle. Um, so trying to add in those additional layers of security and add in additional separation, I think, is really a, the big part of what we're doing today for the future of automated vehicles. And so I think it, it all goes back to that, that cultural change that we're talking about is trying to build out this concept that cybersecurity is required to be able to enable these advanced features and that we can't have one without the other. We can't have safety without security. And the two are coupled very closely together. Rafael, you might speak, but you're muted. I was going to say, what, building on what Christy said, I think the auto industry needs to decide, are you protecting the automated individual vehicle or are you centralizing everything? Because there's two different ways to protect through that lens. Obviously, both need to happen, but if a vehicle is automated and going back to a single source for its next action, its next route, um, that could be problematic if someone was to get into the mainframe of everything um, and then be able to drive different behaviors within those automated vehicles. So I think it's great that they're separating the social cloud offerings from the safety functions is what I would say of a vehicle. But I do think that um, there's different layers of security that are going to have to be applied um, to ensure that it's protecting the individual vehicle, but also the masses and that's going to be a big burden for the automakers because they if we don't help each other get this right and i'm saying cybersecurity and auto it could potentially ruin their brand and fairly quickly which we've seen in other industries when it comes to technology so it's it's um it i don't think it's them needing uh, cyber, the auto industry needing to do it alone there's been so many lessons learned by all of us that have already gone through this with other uh, platforms um, but that, that's where I see that kind of uh, influx in the road of which way are we going so that there is some sort of standard to that. 
Yeah, very good. I increasingly hear, hear the opinion that um, automate or self-driving vehicles will be owned by fleets rather than end consumers. And one reason is security, you know, like the, um, the, the fleet or the car maker doesn't want to give the decision whether you update the software in your car, for instance, to the end consumer. They might be enabled to just say, no, this is necessary and we push the update into the car. Um, so how do you feel around software updates, ownership and self-driving vehicles? Well, I, I was past CIO. No end user wants to be the IT person. <laughs> we see it all the time with all software updates. Like you mentioned, they might just hit no. And then when it's your computer, that could lead to a hack. When it's your vehicle, that could lead to a safety. So uh, I go, I, I think it goes back to what are the different tolerances for those that are tied to safety. I think it should come from a fleet uh, approach. I think if it's a social media type applications that are um, being leveraged for radio and other uh, ease of use that it might be an option, but um, I wouldn't put it in the hands of the consumer for the safety items. I don't know how Christy spoke to that, but I, I would definitely um, break them apart as being in the IT industry for <laughs> a long time. End users either are distracted, busy, or just simply don't want to take the steps necessary to update. All right, very good. So now come to the very last question to all of you. Try to make it short. We have one minute left. Um, what do you think is the most important or urgent next step? Why don't we start with um, Cindy? Okay, I'm having some trouble with my uh, camera, but I think I can, can you still hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, mine's kind of the obvious training, um, training the current and future workforce in cybersecurity practice around these cyber physical systems and critical infrastructure and, and really coupling that with that industry academia partnerships. Um, I, that's essential. And, you know, I, I hope that um, I'm, I'm encouraged and excited about the collaboration that's already been taking place and helping to develop the program we're working on. Um, and you know, I, so I, I really see some good positive steps in that direction, so. Yeah, very good, thank you. Christy. Yeah, I think we've touched on it a little bit already, but I think, you know, building out some more greater opportunities for collaboration, not just across the research community and academia, but also across our industry, right? You know, we see more and more that the hacker community is really good at sharing information and they're really good at partnering together and building off of each other's successes. And then on the industry side, as Andre alluded to, uh, our challenge is that everything we do, we consider to be IP and we don't want to share it at all. And we don't really want to learn from each other in that same way. So we're, we're looking at ways to break down some of those barriers in the industry. Um, organizations like the auto ice tech obviously are, are a great help in trying to break down some of those but this is a big cultural change for our legal teams to understand for our you know uh traditional executives to even understand the way that cybersecurity needs to be approached and looked at is different than the way that we have traditionally built vehicles for the last hundred plus years and it's something that we need to make accommodations for and change our thought process and our culture around it Perfect. Sam? Yeah, I think even looking at the, the threat modeling now, as we get into an automated vehicle that doesn't have a driver, what are the passengers going to be doing or going to be able to do in the vehicle as it's moving down the street? Um, and so really looking at what we're putting into vehicles as far as technology goes and how we're going to support it for the 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and even looking at the model, who's going to own it, whether it is a fleet or a personal vehicle and, and how those things are going to be handled. Um, I think those things should probably get sorted out before we start putting them on the road. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Rafael? Um, I, I agree with both. I think the biggest piece is to have others with a different lens look into the space and help. Um, and that, um, that can be with collaboration or even partnerships, but to try to do it alone would be a mess. I also think 
having ethical hackers involved will, will guide um, the auto industry on what to look for because that's how the other industries have done this um, and obviously thought leaders. So, you know, once you've done that, then I think you can create the standards. Um, doing the standards first before that would be a mess in my opinion. All right, very good. Thank you so much. So we are two minutes over time. I hope everyone enjoyed the panel. I would uh, certainly give you a huge applause now. And um, I don't know if our emails are shared, but you know, certainly if anyone has questions afterwards, um, I'm sure all of us are happy to receive emails and uh, try to respond to them. All right, thank you so much and enjoy your lunch.